Uh, anyway, if you're visiting with us, I'll just mention there are some little cards. There should be cards in the pew back. Welcome to SBC. Just ask your name, email. That way I can connect with you and say hello and welcome you, you know, in that format. So if you want to fill that out, it's great. If you don't, okay, too. Um, if you do, there's a, two little boxes on the wall there between the audio door and this fellowship hall door that Joshua is going out now. You can just slip it in either one of those boxes. <clears throat> Thank you, Joshua, for standing in to point those out. And so, um, but anyway, that'll be nice. I also have like a weekly, well, actually twice weekly. So bi-weekly, I send out notes for the lessons that'll be taught that week. So I usually send one out Wednesday for Wednesday night and Saturday for Sunday morning. So um, you can, if you want to be on that list, you can always just tell me or you can write, I want to be on the email list on your welcome card or even if you're not here filling out for the first time but you want to be on it, you can still use one of these welcome cards and I'll put you on the list. So um, anyway, let's um, let the children go, right? You guys can go on to Children's Church. <clears throat> I have no idea what's wrong with my voice. It just happened. Um, also, you'll notice in the back of the pews, there's some new Bibles, I think, that have probably been placed. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So these are all New American Standard, which is what I'm typically teaching from. Looks like I'll be teaching from this morning since mine is somewhere else. <laughs> um, and, and that's fine. But um, I use usually a Rari Study Bible uh, for my own personal Bible. Oh, thank you. And so that just that has some notes. They're not inspired, of course, but I think they're usually very good notes. Uh, so if you're looking for a study Bible, that might be a direction to head. If you need help buying one, I'll help you. Um, the important thing is to learn the Word of God. We're going to be in Titus, and we're going to get through most of the book, and then next week I'll complete the book and make some applications and what we can do, take away from the book of Titus. Remember, the, the T books are all together in the New Testament, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, uh, Titus. So those are all lumped together. All right, as we get started, let's have a word of prayer, right? And I always give believers an opportunity to use 1 John 1.9. 1 John's written to believers. It's encouraging believers to uh, be in fellowship with the Lord. When they commit personal sin, they need to confess. And that put, you know, God is faithful and just to uh, forgive us our sin and cleanse us as believers and restore us to fellowship, at which point we are abiding. And that's the condition we want to walk in daily is be abiding in him and he in us so that, you know, we bear fruit. And so um, that's First John. And I always just give people an opportunity because there may be something they need to confess privately. And so let's um, have an opportunity for that and then a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the so great salvation we have in Christ. Thank you that we're set apart from the world at the instant of faith in Him, uh, even as you described the Corinthians as saints and in Christ. And so we thank you for the position that we hold. At, ask, Lord, that, of course, uh, we would live out this position in our daily experience and learn, learning the principles of living the Christian way of life. We hear the word and through faith, or through uh, hearing comes faith, and that's, that's the application of the faith rest drill, applying the promises of God, trusting your promises on a daily basis as a provision for our thought life, for every area of our doing life, so that we live lives that are pleasing to you, and there's a good production in the world that benefits others and becomes a light to the world. So we ask that Christ's life, of course, would uh, shine through ours and... Uh, this dark place that we live in, this world, uh, would see that light, have cause to ask for reason, that the, uh, for the hope that's in us, and we'd be able to give an answer and do so with gentleness and reverence, respecting the image of God in all people, <clears throat> and that people might be attracted to Christ through us, and we may you know, be able to give them the gospel they could believe as we believed and have everlasting life. So uh, teach us about, in Titus, the importance of of orderliness there and sound doctrine so that they could be a different people on the island island of Crete 
It's a very corrupt uh, culture. And um, that the, the culture not creep into the church and the church become just like the culture, but rather they could be a light to society around them. So give us wisdom and insight as we look at these um, important teachings that Paul has for Titus and for the island of Crete and the churches there. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Titus 1, 2, and 3. It's a short book. We'll be done pretty quickly, and I'll probably get back to the framework, and we'll do the New Testament portion of the framework, which means that I'll back up and I'll review the Old Testament framework before we go because it's been a while since we've been in the framework. Uh, but that'll be coming here in a few weeks. <clears throat> Um, let's uh, back up a little bit. I want to say a few things about chapter 1, 2, and 3 in the book of Titus, because he's going somewhere in chapter 3. Okay, so Titus chapter 1, uh, maybe the key word is elder or qualified elders. That's what he wants Titus to appoint in the house churches on the island of Crete, because this is the leadership, and the leadership, of course, has to be in order. And if it's not, well, everything's going to be chaos. Chapter 2, you might call, uh, you know, orderliness for all people group or something like that. Because here you're going to talk about older men, what, how they ought to live within the church. You're going to talk about younger, uh, I mean, older women and how they ought to live in the church. You're going to talk about younger women, younger men. And in that day, they had slaves in the Roman Empire. And, and we don't, so we will just say employees, you know, and go at it from an application standpoint. Um, and then some doctrine to explain why you have to have the, this order in the church. So everything in chapter 1 and 2 is really within the church. That's kind of a key to understanding because things are going to shift in chapter 3. In chapter 3, it's going to be how do we live outside the church, uh, among uh, you know, our governing authorities and in, in society at large. And so you can see then from Paul's way of thinking is that first you have to have orderliness within the church before you can ever get to this idea that the church is now going to go out into society and live orderly lives and be a witness to society. I think we have pretty good order as far as the local church. Um, hopefully I qualify uh, according to Titus 1, 6 through 9, the domestic, social, uh, personal and doctrinal qualifications that are listed there uh, to be an under shepherd of this assembly, right? And if I if I'm not, you have to tell me, or I'll uh, of course you know check myself. But you you can point that out. Um, chapter two then is really is for all of us, but um, mainly you know you're going to fit in one of those categories for the most part. So if you're here's the thing. If you're an older man, and we said that in this time it was anybody, you know, over 40 years of age. So if you're an older man, you need to look at chapter 2, verse 2. And it's just one verse. Uh, just one verse. <laughs> Can you focus on those things? See, because that's going to be the order that we enjoy within the assembly. Okay? It's, it's, it's incumbent upon you to look specifically. And to dig into these words, headed, you know, level headedness. Uh, look into dignified, look into sensible, which is somebody who's kind of, kind of serious minded, not doom and gloom, but sensible. Okay, go through these words, get a good sense of what it is exactly how you are to live. What's happening? I don't know what happened. Is it not working? Uh, older women. I didn't call you old. <laughs> I said older. Paul did that on purpose. I think it's funny. Um, there are some things there in verse 3 that you really want to take note of. Because I'll be frank with you, for all these, whether it's older men, older women, and so forth, they're all difficulties for us, and that's why Paul's pointing them out. For example, with the older men, to be sensible, to be serious-minded, a lot of older men, they just want to joke all the time. It's just a continual joke. There's no serious-mindedness about it. So think about that. 
For older women, for example, it might be a temptation to be a malicious gossip, you know, to slander people's character. Paul put these out under the inspiration of the Spirit on purpose. He didn't just select some random things. God, the Holy Spirit, knows where we need what we need. For younger women, you know, everything here that surrounds the home in which we talked about, this is her main sphere of, of sanctification. This is where God grows the woman. It's primarily in the home, you know, with the children and, and um, in subjection to her husband, loving her husband, all these things. And so then the young men... Okay, again, you look at these things, okay, because this is all necessary for getting to chapter three. Okay, that's the reason I'm highlighting this. You, you can't go out in the world as a church and be a light to the world if you don't have order and sound doctrine in the church. I mentioned sound doctrine because chapter two, verse one, uh, when Paul tells Timothy, as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. So sound doctrine orderliness, okay, meaning we're living our lives according to the descriptions given here for our, let's just say, age group. And then finally, that is to work its way out in good works. The end of verse 14, uh, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. Not just, not just for good works, but zealous for them. Like That means wanting to do them, having a zeal for doing good works. So all that in chapter 1 and 2 is within the church. It's the corrective for the churches at Creep, And everything has to be in order. And now what he's going to do in chapter 3 is he's going to launch out into the world and how we live out among the world. Okay, so <clears throat> chapter 3 verse 1 relates to our subjection to governing authorities. God created a human government after the flood. So before the flood, there was no human government. But, but, but after the flood, God set humans uh, to be civil authorities over other humans. And the cornerstone of human government is capital punishment. If a man sheds a man's blood, so shall his blood be shed, right? And so the reason was because man is made in the image of God. So to destroy another man by murder is to destroy the image of God. And so that becomes the cornerstone for human government and curbing evil in societies. Now, obviously, um, capital punishment can be um, applied in a way that's not good. It can be, in fact, misapplied. Somebody can be uh, capitally executed uh, when they did not commit a capital crime. Uh, just for example, Jesus Christ um, he was capitally executed, yet he did nothing, right? So I think God knew all these things, yet he still gave capital punishment as the cornerstone for human government. Because if you don't have, if a government doesn't have the power to take another person's life, they really ultimately don't have any power because they can't stop people from taking other people's lives. Uh, even the gun that the policeman holds is a symbol of capital punishment. Uh, he can, given the proper circumstances, use that to kill someone. And it would not be murder because in, in the case that he's fulfilling his duty. Okay, because killing and murder obviously are not the same thing, right? Murder is, you know, it's a malicious taking of human life, whereas justice under a governing structure is justice. It's carrying out justice. So... Or if you're in war, you know, that's different. That's not murder. Okay, so, but the bottom line is that God created human government, okay? And so he wants us, in verse 1, to be subject to it. Notice, remind them to be subject to rulers. Basically, 95% of the Christian life is just being reminded. Um, you learn things, but then you forget things, and you need to be reminded. So you come here on Sunday, you come here on Wednesday, why do you come? Mostly to get reminded. I felt at one point in my ministry, I always had to say something unique, something new that would stimulate people. And then I realized that's silly. The Bible keeps saying, remind, be reminded. Even the Lord's Supper, you know, it's for what? It's to remember. So it's just to go back to the cross and remember those things. 
So most of it's just being reminded. Because why? Well, because we're humans and we love to forget. It's easy to forget. So remind them to be subject to rulers. Hupatasso, this idea of ranking yourself under the rulers, first of all, and the authorities. Okay, so these are both governing powers. The rulers are the higher governing powers. The authorities are the lower governing powers in this description. And he's saying believers should be obedient and obedient to these governing powers. And he says we should be ready for every good deed. There it is. There's the key word of the book, good deeds. But this is talking about good deeds in society relative to governing powers. So, in other words, ready to help the police, ready to help the governing power, any opportunity to be a help to them, to serve them in whatever capacity we can, and also to help other citizens be good citizens. Okay, Help other people in our society uh, fulfill their responsibilities and be good citizens. We should be helping. We should be, in fact, ready. See, it says ready to do these every good, good deeds. Ready means looking for the opportunities in, out in society. And I'm, I'm sure those who are here who are in law enforcement and related um, positions of authority um, would, could attest to the, the help it is when other citizens are, you know, helping along these lines and are, you know, coming alongside them in any way that they can to help them fulfill these responsibilities and make their lives, you know, easier. Um, so we should be looking for or ready for every good deed out in society. Now, uh, verse 2, we ought to also be peaceable as we live in society. He says, to malign no one, to be peaceable, to be gentle, and show every consideration for all men. Again, all men is signifying this is just all society, out in society. So we should be reminded not to malign them, which means to slander you know, other people's character. That's so easy to do. It makes us feel good about ourselves to put somebody else down, to slander them. And that's what the world does. But that's not what we're supposed to do. Slander's easy. You know, just slander someone's character. Just drag them through the mud. He says, not, we're not supposed to do that. Because if we do that, again, we're not any different than the world around us. And then, how are you going to be a light to them? You, you can't be. Also, to be peaceful. Peaceful. This means not to, you know, be agitators, okay? Not to be contentious and, and cause these problems. And I'm sure we've all failed. I've, I know I've failed in this. I've had uh, been contentious. Out in open society, that was not, that was not good. Uh, shame on me, right? But we, we shouldn't be agitators. We should be peaceable. <clears throat> and further, we should be gentle with others and considerate of others. So gentle with others, considerate of others. This word consider is from the word we get humility. Um, in Philippians 2, it talks about, you know, being humble and putting others above yourself, right? And serving their interests rather than just your own. And then it gives the Lord Jesus Christ as an example of one who humbled himself, right? Taking to himself the form of a bondservant, you know, and he, he did everything for us. He laid down his life for us. Um, and it's the most humble um, example ever in the history of the world. Um, him giving himself for us, not serving his own interests, but serving our interests. And this word, consider it, means to put others out in society ahead of yourselves. And, and that's not easy to do because the world is just take, 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 take. So when you go out in the world, you're not supposed to be take, take, take. You're supposed to be give and be considerate of others and put others ahead of yourselves. So this is how we're to live in society. And obviously, if we live this way, and if these people at Crete live this way, they're going to be very different from the culture at Crete <laughs> because these were the lazy beasts, the, 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 the gluttons, the, the always lying. You know, it was a corrupt, uh, slandering type of society. So they would be very different. And that's what Paul's going for. He wants a different people living out in the world, in society. Um, in verses 3 now, notice what he does, 3 through 7 is he starts with the word for. Um, is this projector on? I meant to turn it on, although I haven't written anything here, but... Well, it's not on. Do I need to hit a button to turn something on? Yes, yes nods work. Um, I don't know, is, is it... 
but it's not recognizing it. But you know, it's okay. Notice that word for, okay? See that word for at the beginning of verse 3? That's giving a reason. That's giving a, he's now going to say, this is the reason you should live this way in society, okay? So I'm going to write this down because this is a common transition word in um, all of Paul's letters. And it's, it's the Greek word gar, um, you know, like the fish, but not a fish. Okay. And uh, one time I caught like a four-foot gar, like on a river in southeast Oklahoma. It was about, the body was about that big around, about the size of a size three soccer ball. The uh, thing was scary. Its mouth was about that long and teeth going through, you know, from the bottom up through the top. Anyway, maybe you'll always remember this word now. Okay, gar, four. Now, he's using it to give explanation or reason for why we ought to live this way among governing authorities and society at large. And if you look, so this is a doctrinal section, okay? It's doctrine, it's theology. Now, if you look back at chapter 2, verse 11, remember this? What is the first word in chapter 2, verse 11? No, it's gar. I already told you this. No. Yeah, four. It is the same Greek word, though, too, okay? And this was the first doctrinal section to give an explanation for why we ought to live orderly lives, right? Older men, younger men, older women, younger women, so forth. Um, and he gives a doctrinal treatise in verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. Those are our memory verses over the next you know, four-month period. Um, now he's doing the same thing, okay? He's going to give us a little doctrinal treatise to explain why we ought to live this way among society. And so verse 3, for we also were once foolish ourselves. Um, he's talking about unbelie the unbelieving society, right? And he's saying they're, they're foolish, which does mean spiritually and intellectually dull, okay? That, that's what it means, spiritually and intellectually dull. I, you know, obviously I used, you know, for example, I used to, um, you know, I used to believe in evolution, you know, and this type of thing. Um, now, you know, as much of the information as I had to acquire to be able to give a charted outline of the uh, physical evolution, chemical evolution, and biological evolution, um, intellectually it's, it's dull, like it's not, there, because it's not true, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not even close to true. And so, you, you know, you kind of have to close your eyes to reality to come to these types of conclusions and support them. So he says, you know, that's who we used to be. We used to be uh, intellectually and spiritually dull. We lived like God wasn't there, and we tried to explain everything as if God uh, wasn't there. And, but that's not who we are anymore, as we'll see in verse 4. So we go on in verse 3, though, and he says, also, uh, we were disobedient which means rebellious against civil authorities, contextually, you know, causing problems in society. We were also deceived, which, you know, means that you're led astray uh, by false ideas, like evolution. That's just an example. But being led astray, uh, and the one who's ultimately behind all the deception is the great deceiver, Satan himself. So, um, we, but we used to be like that. That used to be us, right? We also used to be, he says, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. You know, the world is attracted to certain um, things, okay, that are enslaving to the sin nature. The sin nature wants those things. It lusts after those things. It's pleasured by those things. And, and we still have a sin nature. But that's not, that's who we used to be, enslaved to those things. Notice slaves. I like to point that out about unbelievers, that they're not like just, yeah, free. They're, they're enslaved to their sinful nature, and they want to fulfill the lusts of that nature. And really, it's bondage, right? It's a picture of Israel in, in Egypt, you know, in bondage, you know, making the mud bricks, you know, and building whatever structures they were building for the Pharaoh, doing, working for someone else who had them deceived. To the extent when they left and went out of Egypt, what they want to do? They just want to go back. Okay? Well, this used to be us. We were enslaved, right? To various lusts of our sin nature and pleasures. And, and, and that's all we wanted to 
satisfied. Also, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and, and hating one another. Um, you know, when I taught this to the seminary students, you know, I slowed down here because if you really kind of think about the world around you, you, have, you go to your workplace or you go wherever you go and you see people in society all around you, driving, walking, talking, speaking on the radio, whatever, it kind of appears like, well, everything's okay. Like society's an okay place. And, and yet, if you look at this description, you know, malice is going on, envy is going on, hateful, hating one another. That is what's going on. And I told them that when you look out at society, it kind of appears kind of benign. But it's just a thin veil that is covering the most heinous core. And if anything disrupts society, you will see it come out. You will see the core, the hate, the envy, the selfishness. It will all come out very quickly. And it's a little bit scary. But that, it, it, all you are seeing out there in, in society is just a thin veil covering wickedness. And I think the world, of course, uh, people in the world are empty. They're broke. They're enslaved to their sinful nature. They, they're lost. I mean, that's how the Bible calls them. They're lost. And in their need of salvation, right? But, you know, verse 3 is saying, hey, we used to be the same way. When we were unbelievers, we used to be the same. Now, but, notice verse 4, but, that's one of the great words in the Bible, but, because it signals a contrast, right, with our prior life. We're, this is not who we are anymore. He says, when the, the kindness of our God appeared and, and his love for mankind appeared, okay, he saved us. Now, that's a grand statement, but notice verse 4, kindness of our God and Savior, love for mankind appeared. How, who is mankind here? Is that just the elect? Or is that all people? Okay, that, that's all people. I mean, any natural reading would conclude that's, that's everybody. Um, God, our Savior, you know, He sent someone who appeared, obviously the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, he came from mankind, okay? And so we call this unlimited atonement. I point this out because it's been pointed out twice in this book already, because it was in chapter 2, verse 11. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, you know, unlimited atonement means that God sent Christ to provide salvation for all men. And it doesn't mean that he's going to save all men. It just means the provision has been made in Christ's death and resurrection. It is limited, the atonement is limited, in that it's only enjoyed, salvation is only enjoyed by those who believe. Right? But of course we have um, Calvinism, in the five points of Calvinism, who would one of the points is L in the TULIP. They have a TULIP acronym. The L means limited atonement. They don't, they don't agree with the unlimited atonement idea that God sent Christ to pay the sin penalty for all people, for all men. They say, no, that God in Christ only sent Christ to die for the sins of the elect not the sins of the non-elect. And they also think that if he had sent him to die for all sins of all people, then all people would be saved. But they say, well, obviously not all people are saved. And so therefore Christ not, could not have died for all people's sins. And hopefully you're getting stuck in this logic right now going, he, her, he, her. Because that's what they want you to do, is get, get buying into their rational, rationalism and logical constructs and not into what Scripture says. 
Scripture is obviously logical, okay, but they just have a different logical structure. Um, but God, the, what is the problem with God providing salvation for all men and then only applying it to those who believe? Well, I mean, which he says over and over, hundreds, I've got 198 verses that say that the condition on the human side to enjoy the salvation is faith or belief. I've got 198 verses. What do we do with all those verses? Um, clearly, you know, God has put a condition on humans that we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's what Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. He didn't say, now, if you're one of the elect, you'll believe inevitably and you'll be saved. But if not, too bad he didn't die for you. You know, so they have to go to all the passages like John 3.16. So for God so loved the world that he gave his own. Listen, oh, the world of the elect. Except cosmos, that word, doesn't have in its semantic range a limited value like that. Or they'll go to a passage like 1 John 2.2. He's the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. What do you do with that? World of the elect. That's really their explanation. Talking about other people that haven't come to salvation yet, but they're elect and they're out there. Yeah. But these are not, in, in my mind, they're not convincing, although I've you know, argued with these people a lot um, to try to you know, at least understand their point of view and maybe convince them of the, that that's not what the Scriptures say. But there's passages like this, and we're looking at one right here in Titus chapter 3, 2.11 and 3.4, uh, that the kindness of our God and Savior appeared in His love for mankind. Okay, His love for mankind. That's talking about the first coming of Christ, His first appearance. And He saved us. Now, we get to find out on what basis He saved us in verse 5. Remember, these are all reasons that we should live different in the society under governing authorities, right? Because He came to, for all people. And so this is, you see the testimony idea? that Paul is hoping for in our lives. And he saved us, and then he says, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. So not on the basis of human good. You know, things that we consider that are good, that unbelievers do. Oh, did you see what so He gave this much money to this foundation, and he did that, and he did this. Oh, he's a good, he's a good guy. She's a good girl. Okay, all this stuff, okay, that's all just human good. And what this is saying in verse 4 is that God did not save us on the basis of deeds which we've done in human righteousness. He didn't save anybody on the basis of any human good. Okay. But rather, verse 5, what basis did he save us on? His mercy. A mercy is not getting what you deserve. What do we all deserve according to Scripture? Everlasting separation from God. Death. Everlasting separation from God. But He saved us on a basis of mercy. That means it couldn't be based on anything that we did. Because if we got what we deserved, it would be eternal separation from God. Right? Right? But he saved us according to his mercy, not giving us what we deserved, but rather giving us what we don't deserve, which is salvation. So he says, and then he gives us the means, right? In verse 5, by, that would signify means, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Now that's not really two separate things. Okay, that chi, that's translated and, that word and, it can also be a sense of and which would be translated even, which is just giving further explanation of what regeneration is. So um, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, that work, is inclusive of or is explained by the idea of the renewing work of the Holy Spirit. So what is this regeneration that is a renewal? Regeneration is this idea that he makes your human spirit alive. Okay. See, your human spirit in, in the condition of sinfulness in which we're conceived and born um, is separated from God. It's dead to the things of God. 
So what he does at the moment that we believe, and he'll say that in a moment, but um, is he makes your human spirit alive to the things of God, cleansing it, that's the renewal aspect, cleansing it, cleansing it from sin. Okay, so that your human spirit can now commune with God, okay, and the things of God. So this is the means by which he saved us. It's by regeneration, that is, the renewal work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, this is interesting, he poured out. What do we say happened on the day of Pentecost? We go to Acts chapter 2. And we say, all right, it says in the text, it was a, there was a, Peter says there was a pouring out of the Spirit. Remember that? This is the only other place in the New Testament that it describes in that similar language what happened the moment you believed and were regenerated. That there was an outpouring of the Spirit upon you at that moment. So in a way, Pentecost does repeat itself, not at Asbury, okay? Um, in a way, though, Pentecost gets repeated in that the moment you believe, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon you. Now, at that moment, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And you don't ever get any more of the Spirit. Like, you, you got it. Now, you can, there, we went through some difference. He does a lot of things. He regenerates. We just saw that. He indwells. He baptizes us, putting us into the body of Christ, changing our identity. He seals us in Christ, right? He seals us. This is particularly talking about the indwelling. Okay? He was poured out upon us so that he indwells us. All believers have the Spirit indwelling them, Romans 8, 9. If you do not have the Spirit, you do not belong to him. And you can't lose it. In fact, he sticks around even when you sin, so that if we sin, we grieve him, right? Ephesians 4, 30. So he never leaves us. This indwelling presence is there. You can't get more of him or less of him, except in this sense. You can be filled by the Spirit on a daily life, lifestyle basis or not. Okay, Ephesians 5.18, he says, But I tell you, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled by the Spirit. And then he describes manifestations of the Spirit, like singing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, lifting one another up. This is a manifestation of the Spirit when we are filled with the Spirit. Another way to say filling of the Spirit is to talk about walking by the Spirit or being led by the Spirit. So not all Christians are led by the Spirit, even though they have the Spirit indwelling them, okay, because they quench or grieve the Spirit and don't want to live by Him. But whenever we do live or walk by the Spirit or are filled by Him, then, of course, He manifests His life through us. And so we have all been saved by means of the Spirit who washed us with regeneration, cleansing our human spirit, uh, putting it in connection with God, right, and he has been poured out upon us so that he now indwells us. And it says he indwells us richly. Okay, so there's a wealth of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. He's taken up residence us. And it occurred, this pouring out occurred through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The pouring out occurred through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, if it occurred through Jesus Christ, who sent the Spirit through Jesus Christ? Well, we are all the way back to verse 4, God, okay? God, our Savior, <laughs> He saved us, verse 5. He's the one who, by means of the washing of regeneration, even renewal of the Spirit, He poured out upon us richly through Christ, our Savior, the Spirit. So look, did you just see the Trinity in there, by the way? Father in verse 4 and 5, um, the Spirit in verse 5, and the Son, Jesus Christ, in verse 6. So there's Trinity in these, th these three verses. Some people say, no, there's no Trinity. You know, we don't believe Jesus was God or the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit's just a force, you know, and stuff like this. I'm like, is this like Star Wars theology? I mean, like, what is going on? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, you, they, this is a, a natural reading in the text. I mean, in verse 6, who's our Savior? Just, just, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 6, who's our Savior? Jesus Christ. Now go to tell me in verse 4 who's our Savior. God. 
Now, if God has already saved me, why do I need Jesus who's less than God to save me? Unless Jesus really is God. See, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Why would he say Jesus Christ our Savior if Jesus is less than God? Because if God has already saved me in verse 4, why do I need Jesus to save me? I've got God of the universe has already saved me. And Jesus is just the first creation in these, these religions. So that wouldn't add anything to what God had already done. What would be the point of that? So that doesn't make any even logical sense. Um, they're both Savior. God is the one who provides salvation. Christ is the one who procures salvation. Did you hear that? God is the one who provides salvation in giving His Son. In Christ, His Son is the one who procures salvation. I always say, God the Father did not get crucified for you on a cross, did He? No. But the Scriptures tell us God sent His Son. Uh, John 3.16, it tells us in Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent His Son, born under the law. So God is the one who provides salvation, and Christ is the one who procures it. So you can say both God is our Savior and Christ is our Savior. It, it, it's good. It, this is good. And so um, He has done this. Now, verse 7 there's a lot of theology here. Verse 7, that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs. Okay, usually we say we're justified by what? What's the usual expression that came out of the Reformation? Justified by faith, right? But here it says we're justified by grace. Grace is looking at it from God's point of view. Faith is looking at it from man's point of view, isn't it? Because... Faith is man's requirement. Grace is what only God can do. Okay? Justified by grace. Grace means unmerited favor. It means he didn't justify you on the basis of any merit that was in you, anything you did. We already knew this. He already said, not based on anything which we have done in righteousness. Verse 5. Um, but he justified us by grace. Right? He's also mentioned mercy. So grace is unmerited favor. And justification is a legal term. That's very important because in this verse, you're also an heir. How do you get to be an heir just in this world? Don't you have to be legally an heir? I mean, if you're not legally an heir, you're not the heir. So justification is a legal term. And it refers to the declaration of righteousness. You are declared righteous in God's sight. And that happens at the moment you have faith, okay? Because we are justified by faith, or through faith. We're also justified by grace. It's just looking from man's side versus looking at it from God's side. The only thing that's consistent with grace is faith. Okay, Romans 4, 16. I don't have this one memorized, so I'll have to uh, skip back real quick and read it. But Romans 4, 16. For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace... See, faith and grace go together. But Romans 11, verse 6, if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So grace can't get together with works. So whatever this faith is that we have to have, it can't be a faith that works. Did you hear what I just said? I cannot sneak works into faith like so many teachers like to do. They do it in James 2 all the time. See, it's got to be a faith that works. If you don't have a faith that works, then you didn't really have faith, the right kind of faith to begin with, and you're not saved. James 2, even the demons believe. I've heard it 10,000 times. Read James. He's writing to believers, and he's talking about living by faith in the Christian life, not how to go to heaven. He's saying, oh, some of you say you're living by faith, but you don't have any works. So what then? He says, you're lying. You're not living by faith. <laughs> he doesn't have anything to say about whether they're believers or not. He's already said in chapter 1, verse 18, that God brought them forth by His Word and planted His seed within them. Do you know any unbeliever has the seed of God implanted in them? Yet, by, teachers around the world get away with this. Every single Sunday and Wednesday and any other day they might be in the pulpit saying, you've got to have a faith that works. Friends, Romans 11, 6 and Romans 4, 16. It's by faith only. And 
if it has any works in it, grace is no longer grace. So it's not about a faith that works. It's about just having faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the sole requirement. Once you've done that, any works that come after don't have anything to do with whether you had the right kind of faith or not. They have to do with whether you're living by faith or not. It's really that simple. But the problem is, is that the human nature wants to contribute something. And so hey, it just can't be just faith alone. That's exactly what Roman, the Roman Catholic counter-reformers said in the 1550s and 1560s. That's exactly what their argument was against the Protestants. You can't tell people they're justified and heirs of God just by faith. If you tell them that, they'll just go live like hell. You're saved, you're going to heaven. Oh, great, I can live it up. I can do whatever I want, I'm still going to go to heaven. And so the Protestant reformers said, okay, well, it's got to be a specific kind of faith. It's got to have a faith that has works they attend to it, and if it's not, you didn't really have faith to begin with. And what that did was it destroyed the gospel, and it destroyed the freeness of salvation, and it destroyed, really, the freeness of justification by faith. I mean, that comes from the Reformation, right? Justified by faith alone in Christ alone, right? But it's not, they'll say, well, it's faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. Now, would you stop it already? Why do you got to, do all this complication of thing. I'll tell you, who makes things complicated? We do, Satan does. Okay, God doesn't. He's made it very clear in verse 5 that we're not saved on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. And he makes it very clear in verse 7 that we're justified by grace. He makes it very clear in verse 5 that it is according to his mercy. So do you see anything about mercy plus, well, faith that works, you know, or faith that has works? No, you don't read any of that. And the reason you don't read any of that is because it's not anywhere in the Bible. That's why you don't read it. But everybody's got to, you know, get their hands on the gospel and mess it up. And that's why Paul wrote Galatians, to get that all straightened out, right? Can believers desert and leave the gospel of grace? Can, can, can a believer who has believed the gospel truly, and they're justified, can they then later turn around and get confused on the gospel? And teach a false gospel. Yeah, that's what Galatians also says. He says, who bewitched you, Galatians? You know, he says, who put you under spell? He says, why are you so quickly deserting him who called you by his grace for another gospel? So yeah, oh, there's lots of pastors out there who believe the gospel, but now they teach a false one. They will not let you be free. I'm telling you, you are totally free. That God has done this on the basis of his own mercy. He has done this and justified you by grace alone. Okay, and that your works don't have anything to do with it. The only person's works who have anything to do with it is the work of Jesus Christ. He is the only one who said it is finished. When he said that, you know what? He didn't mean that we needed to come along later and say, plus what I did. No, if it's finished, I mean, it's done. There isn't, you can't do anything else, right? But so many teachers say, no, 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 no. It's got to be a particular kind of faith that you have that has these works to attend to it. Let me ask a question to all these people who believe that. How many works are enough to make sure I really had the right kind of faith? How consistent do I need to be? What if I fall off the train for five years? What if I fall off the train for five years and die? Did I not really have the right faith to begin with? This is just, just going to make people worried about whether they're living the life right whether they you know, have the right stuff, as they put it. Okay? No, 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 don't look in here. If you look in here, if you want to sample this, go read a lot of the Puritans. The Puritans had a lot of good stuff. I'm not you know, saying everything's bad. But boy, they were extremely introspective as a people group. It is continually about what's going on. They're looking inside themselves. Let me ask you a question. Should you look in here or should you look up there? You're going to fail if you keep looking in here at yourself and making sure you're doing the right thing and you've got the right stuff. And I think I've got the right faith and all that stuff. You're going to go crazy too. But if you'll look out to Christ, you'll see the satisfaction of God. Because you are looking at the one who did everything for you. He did it in full. It doesn't need anything else. God is perfectly satisfied with him. And when we believe in him, guess what? Now he's satisfied with us because verse 7 says we are justified by his grace, which means God has declared us righteous. He looks upon us and treats us as he treats his own son, Jesus Christ, and no differently. 
not one iota different. He treats you as he treats Jesus Christ right now. That is how he looks upon you. Now, that makes us heirs legally, right? Heirs according to the hope of eternal life or heirs with a view to eternal life. Hope is not something we have yet. If we, if we already had it, we wouldn't hope for it. You know, I hope X. Okay, what are you saying? Something in the future. What is he talking about, the hope of eternal life? Well, you already have eternal life in one sense. It's the moment you believe. Jesus said, he who believes in me has eternal life. But there's another aspect of eternal life. Jesus said in John 10, I came to give life, and not only to give life, but give it abundantly. That's talking about the enjoyment of your eternal life. So you already have it, but now do you enjoy it or not? Are you enjoying it by living the Christian way of life? If you are, you're enjoying your eternal life. But still, there's the hope of eternal life. What's that? It's something still future. It's the messianic kingdom and beyond, where we will spend our eternal life. And that's what he's talking about here. We are legal heirs to the world that is eternal, which begins with the kingdom, the messianic kingdom and Jesus Christ ruling and reigning. Okay? You are a legal heir of that. Everyone who has believed is a legal heir and will be in that kingdom. No one's going to be cast out of the kingdom who has believed. Okay? That's what this is saying. He says, now this is a trustworthy statement. I think speaking of what he just got done saying in verses 4 through 7 about this great theological statement of what we have, uh, that God has saved us. He says, and concerning these things, I want you, Titus, that's a singular, I want you, Titus, to speak confidently okay, to all the churches in Crete so that those who have believed, look at this, there's the word believed. What did we say was the sole condition? Faith, and there it is, believed, okay, who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. Speaking of all men, society at large, right? Now, if you've believed... What are we supposed to do now? Be careful to engage in good deeds out in society. The question, are you saved by good deeds or are you saved for good deeds? For. You're saved for them. You're not saved by them. This is the key idea of the book, though. This is where he wants the people on the island of Crete to be. He wants them to set up order in the church by having qualified elders. He wants everybody to start living in their proper roles and learning sound doctrine. And then he says, the end of that is I want you to be careful to engage in good deeds out there in the world. Because this world's a wicked place. He just described it in verse 3. He says, we used to be those people. We used to be hateful, hating one another. We used to be enslaved to various lusts. We used to be disobedient to authorities and deceived, manipulated by the powers that be. We used to be intellectually and spiritually dull. Okay, but that's not who we are anymore. And these people need salvation just as much as us. Don't they? And so how are we going to get them to ever listen to us? And what we have to say about Christ? Well, good deeds. Here's the deal. The world cares more about what the church does than what the church says. It will always be this way. It will always be this way. They are more interested in what we do than what we say. And they are always looking for places where the church fails because then they're just going to go point the finger. Aren't they? This is exactly what they do. You will never get a hearing with the world and get to give people the gospel unless you are careful to engage in good deeds and show that your life is different than theirs. You won't get a hearing. You can't get a hearing. And frankly, they're right. They are right. Why listen to someone who's a hypocrite? I don't want to be a hypocrite. Do you want to be a hypocrite? No, so you're not going to listen to people who are hypocritical. You're going to listen to people that are genuine and are real. That's why we have to be careful to engage in good deeds. So that it brings profit to all men and they see the light of the gospel in us and they want to know more because twice now he's told us that he came for all men to bring salvation chapter 2 verse 11 to all men to, and, and in chapter 3 verse 4 
the kindness of God and his love for mankind appeared. It's all men. So then do you see the, this plan that Paul has for Titus, this letter? Order, sound doctrine, live a different life in the world, and the world will want to know as we do good deeds among them. And we are given opportunity to give an answer, to explain to them the grace of God in Jesus Christ. It's the grace that you've enjoyed. It's the grace that I've enjoyed. It's the mercy you've enjoyed. It's the mercy I've enjoyed. Why would we want to keep this for ourselves and not engage in good deeds and get to get opportunities to give other people the gospel that they too may enjoy his mercy, right, and his grace? Because there's no greater gift, right? There's no greater gift. All right, I hope this has helped, but that's why we're focusing on good deeds this year, right? This is our key theme for the year. Because it's wonderful to come into fellowship among us, and we have chapter 1 and 2 that discuss that. But chapter 3 says, when we leave this place, folks, you're going out in society at large. And the real issue is, how are we living out there? Because... In the book of Revelation, there's seven little churches, and they're all called what? Lampstands. Seven lampstands. And the question was, was the little church at Ephesus, and the church at Thyatira, and the church at Laodicea, and Smyrna, and Pergamum, were these churches really lampstands to their communities? Were they really? Some of them were kind of snuffed out wasn't so good. They were no longer a testimony to the world because they compromised, they tolerated false doctrine, and all sorts of stuff. They were coming like the, becoming like the world. We can't do that. We have to go out and be different from the world. I think it shows up in the littlest things. You know, I, I really do. I think people see, you know, the way you, you love your wife, the way you respect your husband, the way you train your children, the decisions you make, where to go, where not to go, the time you spend with one another, and the quality of the time that you spend with one another. You know, the, difference, the differences um, make a difference. They add up, is what I mean, in, when people view your life. They add up. And hopefully you're intentional, see, with them, and careful to do good deeds to help them and, and hum humble yourself before them. Because that's what's going to really give you the opportunities when you put all these things together. Okay? All right. I hope that helps. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask, Lord, that um, we would live orderly lives and that, of course, we would be careful and even zealous to do good deeds in the world around us. Always being ready to be peaceable citizens, help those who are in authority over us, thanking you for those who are placed in positions of authority, um, honoring others, humbling ourselves before them to serve them, to give opportunity. May our lives capitalize on all the differences that there are between us and who we used to be before God saved us by his mercy and grace so that we can be a witness, so that we can be a testimony. And teach us these things in this week and the coming weeks, and may we carry them with us for a lifetime. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand. Uh for the deep, deep love of Jesus. And, uh, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge might have also